opiates, opioids and the problems they cause are in the headlines daily, but this drug's use actually started thousands of years ago. The chapter features an in-depth look at methadone's introduction as a treatment for opiate and opioid addiction. We're joined once again by Dr. Robert DuPont, who was in the trenches treating patients when this drug treatment began in the late 60s. DrDrew.com presents the history of, of opium. Ten, methadone, a cautionary tale. Well, now that we've walked through a little bit of the nature of addiction, a little primer on the biology and genetics, let's talk about methadone. The post-World War II era saw an increase in addiction, opioid addiction primarily. This gave rise to crime in urban areas and, in turn, overcrowding in jails. With no effective treatments or detox methods available, the Joint Committee of the American Bar Association and the American Medical Association issued a report in 1958 They recommended an outpatient facility prescribing opiates to treat addiction. They suggest this be established on a controlled and experimental basis. German scientists, as I've described, first produced methadone in the 1930s, became available in the United States in 1947, but its use as a treatment for opioid abuse took off in 1964 when Dr. Neiswander and her husband, Dr. Dole, presented data for two patients that were responding well to high-dose methadone maintenance therapy. They claimed that their patients felt relief from cravings, no longer experienced euphoria. They were also free of side effects and avoided development of any sort of tolerance to the drug. This couple then suggested that high-dose methadone maintenance be a most realistic goal for many of their addicted patients and a preferable alternative to death as well as an alternative to the problematic behaviors associated with shorter-acting opiate addiction. They advanced the idea that methadone maintenance was an acceptable alternative to abstinence and worked to promote to use harm reduction style of treatment. Let me define what harm reduction is for uh, our listeners, because it's not obvious what it is. Basically, it's a series of interventions that seek to reduce some of the harmful, negative, even life-threatening effects of drug use without stopping the drug use. So an example of that would be a needle exchange, for example, or a safe injection site, or for that matter, uh, Narcan revival of, of an overdose victim. There are a whole series of interventions that fall into this category, and, and they all are well-meaning. They are targeted to keeping people alive. And also, the harm, a lot of the harm reduction strategies cater to the using addicts and so the harm reduction strategists support them because they say it's meeting the addicts where they're at and that's true the sort of best thing i can say about harm reduction all of these ideas do a pretty good job of getting people into some kind of contact with health counseling kind of activities but the problem is uh, that the people don't move on to becoming drug free. The term of art is it enables the person to continue using the drugs by reducing some of the risks associated with the drugs. And that's a problem. So my, my approach to it, to harm reduction, is I'm not against harm reduction, but I want to have harm reduction evaluated on its ability to get people into lasting recovery, not to keep them alive for another day. I mean, that's a good thing to keep them alive another day, but it ought to be looked at in terms of where does it go then? What happens then uh, after the needle exchanges? How many of those people get into uh, lasting recovery? And, and when they do, what do they think about their needle exchange experiences? Uh, I, I think that, that the game changes once you get the idea that recovery is possible. And I don't believe there's any hopeless addicts so if somebody says, well, that person can't be helped. No, I don't think that's right. Uh, I think every addict can be helped. And I think the goal for every single addict is recovery, which includes not using. Uh, there, there are many steps to that and many roads to that. I understand. But we have to be clear that there are no hopeless addicts and the goal is recovery. And once we have that, then we can think about uh, harm reduction as part of it. But right now, uh, people just think about it as harm reduction is the answer to the problem. And, and and that's clearly wrong. The concept at the center of the debate over methadone maintenance therapy is whether harm reduction is or is not an acceptable approach to treating opioid addicts. 
Though no definitive definition exists, Dr. Bernadette Pauly, an associate professor of the University of Victoria School of Nursing in Canada, characterizes harm reduction, quote, as a philosophy that shifts the moral context in healthcare away from the primary goals of fixing individuals towards one of reducing harm, unquote. To that end, addiction professionals who offer this type of treatment may be more concerned with decreasing the harms, overdose, crime, medical and psychiatric problems, just to name a few. The advocates of the treatment insist it helps reduce stigma as well associated with illicit and intravenous drug use. The professionals who worked towards abstinence were mortified that physicians were once again making the mistake they had repeated in the historical past, treating one addictive substance with another. To the harm reductionist point, an article published in the Journal of American Medical Association in 2008 reports that methadone treatment and comprehensive rehab programs have been associated with marked improvements in patients' ability to function better overall. Experts tout methadone's legality and long half-life as a good alternative to illicit parenterally administered heroin. Methadone's use is regulated and it's intended to minimize the potential for abuse. Expert on the other side of the debate, including Dr. Robert DuPont, a former drug chief under Presidents Nixon and Ford, argued against methadone. DuPont, an early proponent of methadone, said in an interview for PBS Frontline, quote, I think the simplest way to say it is that it's an addicting drug. How can you treat addiction with an addicting drug? At the end of the day, you're not going to make that sale. It's not going to happen. DuPont now believes that harm reduction approach sends the wrong message. I'm not happy about MAT when it's very tolerant of continued drug use and alcohol use. I had a group of ex-addict advisors when I started the MTA, and 20 years later, one of, one of them was retiring from a job. He'd actually worked at NIDA at the time. And I asked him about the other guys who were uh, in there. They were all recovering heroin, heroin addicts, the whole advisory group. So I asked him about it, and one after the other, he said they were all dead. And I said, well, did they go back on heroin? No, they died of alcoholism. They died of alcoholism. Uh, and I said, this guy's name was Nap Turner, wonderful man. And I said, Nap, why are you alive and they're dead? And he said, it's really simple, Bob. I went to meetings and was part of AA and they didn't go to meetings and weren't part of AA. Now that's a game changer for me. That changed my thinking in a very profound way. When methadone is treating a heroin addict, it's important to deal with his drinking. It's important to deal with his use of other drugs. Too many programs uh, think that all they are is an opioid treatment or an opioid treatment program. No, there are no opioid addicts who don't use other drugs. Lots and lots of them, including 95% of the deaths have multiple drugs. Uh, so methadone, to the extent, or, or buprenorphine or, or naltrexone, to the extent that they are effective, are just effective against the opioids. And you don't have any patients who just use opioids or just abuse opioids or just addicted to opioids. So it's conceptually, you, you got it, it's a really bad mistake to try to be either for or against uh, MAT. It's, it's a matter of saying, okay, let's get to recovery. Let's, let's evaluate. And that's the same thing for two of the drug-free programs. You know, the, 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 the MAT people are all after the, the uh, drug-free programs as being malpractice because of overdose deaths. They're saying you gotta, you gotta give them methadone or, or buprenorphine to keep them from dying. And, and people like Bob DuPont who talk about recovery are the enemies of, of this. They're the, they're the people causing the problem. Uh, and, uh, so, so to me, I say, if, if you have to take a position on one or the other and say, this is the answer, the other one is, I don't like that. I don't agree with that. But I think what brings them together is the recognition that there are no hopeless addicts. And our job as treaters of these people is to respect the person in there who is, will only be seen when that person has stopped using. That's the goal that I have. And that's what keeps me in this uh, business and keeps me excited about it. Methadone is addictive and causes one of the most intense and protracted withdrawal symptoms of any substance. It can last up to six months. Once on, methadone is very unlikely the patient will ever come off, committing the patient to a lifetime of care and chronic illness. Many patients must take high-dose medication indefinitely in order to suppress cravings and problematic behaviors. Severe difficulty functioning may be experienced because of the higher doses. What's more, methadone can still be abused and diverted, often is, 
and it causes up to several thousand deaths a year, especially when it is combined with alcohol and other drugs like benzodiazepines, which is a common combination. The use of harm reduction strategies to control drug use rather than to end it goes to the very core of what it means to treat addiction. Iatrogenic addiction, caused by doctors, as we've said, has both moral and ethical implication and consequences. It raises many questions about what a physician's duty is with regard to bringing about a cure or something like a cure or an improvement in the patient. The bottom line is that methadone maintenance therapy is considered an acceptable form of drug addiction that is facilitated and condoned by a large faction of the medical community. Despite good intentions, many people do not function while on this drug, and at the end of the day, they are still in the grips of an exceedingly powerful substance. However, it is also saving lives, and for polydiagnosed people who with no motivation, who don't want to stop using, this is still a very effective way to approach their addiction. The fact that this has been an acceptable standard for more than 50 years is concerning. We have come up with newer medication to advocate the same approach. You'll hear about Suboxone later. The latest opiate epidemic, however, is merely just another installment. In spite of everything we've learned about methadone's addictive qualities and the inherent difficulty of weaning off, history is repeating itself. Except for harm avoidance strategies, a new medication, as I said, called Suboxone, is being advocated. Like methadone, it has clinical utility, but the excessive enthusiasm mirrors the mistakes the medical system has made over and again when addressing opiate addiction. The current incarnation of harm avoidance involves large supplies of Suboxone be provided at each visit with a provider. This is a marked contradiction to the methadone model in which a provider is seen on a daily basis. Those working with addicts are seeing younger abusers who are diverting the drug and using it in unintended ways at a really alarming rate. Presently, there's a huge black market for Suboxone. Suboxone is uh, kind of methadone light in a way. It's uh... It doesn't require the same program. It's not, there's not a program. There are some uh, users of Suboxone who have, make it as part of a program, and some of them do a wonderful job. Uh, uh, right here in Washington, uh, George Kalodner has a program, an outpatient, pro, outpatient treatment program called COMAC, and they've integrated Suboxone in for their opiate addicts. That's great. Hazelton is a, the, the sort of premier drug-free program is using Suboxone uh, as well as naltrexone. Uh, so I'm, I'm all f- for that. Uh, but Suboxone as the treatment for opiate addiction? I don't think so. Uh, I, I like the idea it's called medication assisted treatment, not medication is treatment. And I think that's the right thing. I, I think it's a lot more than this. I'm respectful though of the people who, who are thinking about the hundreds of thousands of people who are using opioid addicts in the country now. And how do you get to a lot of them fast? And that was the kind of issue that I had uh, back in 1969 and 1970. Uh, And I'm I'm sympathetic to, to, to deploying things that can reach out to lots of people. But I'd like to do it with a, with a more, uh, what I'm going to call integrity uh, and with a focus on recovery uh, being our goal and not just getting the person alive for the next day. Opiate addiction is complicated. It is a medical problem. It requires an array of evidence-based treatments to properly address it. Finding the right treatment for the right patient is still a hotly debated topic. Dr. Dupont is still active in the area of addiction recovery. He founded the Institute for Behavioral Health, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to developing strategies that reduce illegal drug use. Check it out at ibhinc, ibhinc.org. I want to thank our staff at Doctor.com, particularly Michelle Poe, for pulling this opium series together. And also read our entire opioid series, as well as get our weekly medical articles at Doctor.com. Be sure to join our email list by going to Doctor.com slash contact and tell a friend. We appreciate it. Well, CBDs are everywhere, right? Everyone's talking about them. And it's a topic that I get asked about all the time. Bottom line on CBD, although there are way more claims made about them, the clinical evidence right now, it's not all that clear, but many people are using it and reporting great results, and they are very encouraging. So I want to first define exactly what I'm talking about here. CBD is cannabidiol, an extract from hemp. While you might associate with marijuana, CBD does not cause reinforcement. It is not the reinforcing component of hemp, but it is what's responsible for the calming or some of the relaxing effects that many people experience, not the high. Now about the products. There are a ton of them on the market today. For getting the vast array of the reported health benefits, it's important to be aware of what you're buying. 
I was recently introduced to a company called Select CBD, an Oregon-based company that focuses on high-quality ingredients and manufacturing standards. Not the hype. Their CBD-based products are available in a wide range of formulations and flavors, each of which is described to you so you can make an informed decision without all those promises that are probably too good to be true. Like I said, the reported benefits of CBD by individuals using this are very compelling. I'm excited to see how things develop as the science catches up with this booming industry. As usual, the public is ahead of the science. I can't make explicit claims yet, but boy, the reports are pretty encouraging. So if you're ready to try CBD, I encourage you to check out Select CBD. To learn more, go to drdrew.com slash select. That's on my site, drdrew.com slash S-E-L-E-C-T. And for a limited time, you can save 25% at checkout with the code Dr. Drew, D-R-D-R-E-W. Again, drdrew.com slash select, and then the code D-R-D-R-E-W. 